ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the advancing of the colors and singing of the national anthem by Petty Officer Kristen Pageant. Please be seated. We would like to extend a special welcome to Admiral Jonathan Greenert, the 30th Chief of Naval Operations, and Admiral Howard's husband, Wayne, mother, Philippa, sister, Lisa, brother-in-law, David, sister-in-law, Tracy, and Tracy's husband, Sanjay. Vice Admiral Howard will now say a few words. Secretary Mavis, CNO, good morning. My goodness, distinguished guests, and there are a lot of distinguished guests this morning. There are more honorables than I can mention and probably deserve to have here at Farm. There are my fellow admirals and general officers and your precious family and friends. Thank you all for coming. Also, in the spirit of inclusiveness, I'd like to know, are there any undistinguished guests this morning? <laughs> Raise your hand. Thank you also for coming today. I need to thank the Navy Color Guard and Musician Coach Class Pageant for that wonderful handshake and that wonderful flag. It means every time I hear it, it's wonderful. I really appreciate that. 
Mr. Secretary, thank you for hosting today's ceremony. You honor me with your company, which I know is very appreciated. I did want to give you some feedback. As I've traveled over this last year, and I've talked to sailors, and they're from everywhere, from Hot Coffee, Mississippi, or New York City or California, they appreciate your leadership. So thank you for taking care of our sailors and Marines. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this morning it is my duty and honor to introduce the 30th Chief of Naval Operations. Admiral Jonathan Greenert is from but Butler, Pennsylvania. He graduated from Annapolis in 1975. He's commanded several times and is a recipient of the Vice Admiral Stockdale Leadership Award for inspirational leadership. As the 30th Chief of Naval Operations, he has refocused our Navy to core tenets, war fighting first, operate fully, and be ready. More simply put, Benjamin Franklin would say, where liberty dwells, there is my country. Admiral Greenard would say, where liberty dwells, there is the United States Navy. Ladies and gentlemen, Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Jonathan Greener. Okay, Michelle, we're gonna have to uh, work on that. It's, it takes some getting used to. Uh, and uh, I suck up to the secretary. Just remember that, all right? That's my job. Thank you for, for <laughs> bringing us uh, where we are. Because uh, as Benjamin Franklin said. <laughs> okay, Lisa, Mike, uh, I mean, I know you say, well, I saw this years ago running around the house. I don't know. Uh, I could tell you in that little town of Butler, uh, they all said, are you kidding me? Uh, so we'll see what you say. But honestly, uh, Secretary Nader, thank you. Awesome to see you today. Uh, I am extremely proud and excited to be here. Because, uh, well, Michelle has been in a, a tremendous career, 32 years, uh, mainstream, at sea, tough tour, very difficult tours. Michelle came up through uh, the, the amphibious expeditionary warfare arena and came into town uh, and did the hard job for the Navy coming up. And so uh, she is definitely ready to, to assume this position. There is no question in my mind. We know about Captain Phillips Brooks. We know those kinds of things where Michelle saw an opportunity and she grabbed it and, and so that's, that's kind of all said and done. She will bear the burden of the role model, and she is ready to bear that very well. And I'm very excited about that because we need lots more women in the Navy, and we need to be a much more diverse Navy, uh, and role models are important for us. So for that, I am very, very excited. I first uh, saw Michelle up close when she was actually the military assistant for the Secretary of the Navy. And uh, those of us kind of standing on the water cooler flag officers said, we got something pretty special here. Uh, after that, John Harvey asked her to do a study for us, and we were having some real issues down in the fleet. And we needed to get to the bottom line. Why were we having readiness issues? What was happening in and among amphibious ships? Why were they not doing well in our fleet study? So Michelle went down and went into the de deck for you, and she took upon, uh, that's a you know, nuclear phrase, you get what you inspect, not what you expect. And this officer understands that very clearly. So I am very, very, very excited uh, to have her join me uh, and be my teammate here as we move on to lead our Navy. Terrific day, uh, great family, great support. The wardroom's here. They're ready to, uh, to listen and to lead from, from there on out. Uh, and now let me please introduce our uh, host for today, uh, a great, great patriot, a champion of diversity and definitely inclusion, uh, and he has brought us uh, forward into that position where we have women in submarines, and that was, that was uh, kind of a, a hurdle, if you will, or a milestone that we weren't sure how this was going to work out. It's pretty darn difficult.
commitment than all the others. And he's worked very smoothly under Secretary Mays on this uh, leadership. He's been a naval officer, so he knows our culture. He knows what we're about. <clears throat> Go back and Google it and check out the beard. It's really awesome. <laughs> but seriously, he has been governor of the state of Mississippi, and he brought that state forward in tremendous ways. He's been an auditor general, so he's helped us in that regard. And he was the ambassador for the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which is going on very, very good right now. On top of all that, check the ship numbers, uh, and you see very, very tangible evidence of where our Navy has been under his leadership and where it is now. On top of all of that, I find him to be a great boss. Uh, and talking and listening to him and, and understanding him, uh, he, he's a father, and he takes that very seriously, a seriously dedicated sus husband. And he's a, a, just a good and decent man. So please join me in welcoming our 75th uh, uh, Secretary of the Navy, the Honorable Larry Nader. Welcome, everyone, and I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much, Michelle Howard, for asking me to host this and allowing me to participate in it. I have to say that I'm a little bit torn over what to say. I've been thinking about this, and so I'm going to start out in one direction, but have faith. Um, <laughs> I'm going to shift gears. This is, as you all know, an historic day. It's the, <clears throat> we're living in the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act, its passage and signing, the 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer in the American South. We are witnesses to history many, many forms. And for that reason, it is a particular honor to be here to appoint and promote the very first graduate of Gateway High School. shift gears now. <laughs> to appoint Michelle Howard as Jonathan Greenert's only vice. <laughs> this time I promise. I'm <laughs> now, I, I certainly don't want to make light of today and of Michelle Howard's many, many, many accomplishments and many firsts. Um, and you, you know her, you've read about it, one of the first women to attend the Naval Academy, the first African-American woman to command a Navy ship. The fact that she was first put on a sub tank, um, which when I was in the Navy was the only ship that women could serve aboard, but she persisted, moved to ship of the line, won the Collins Award for leadership as a very junior lieutenant, uh, rose through mainly the Gator Navy to command, to, to be XO, to be a CO, to head a task force. And CNO mentioned the rescue of Captain Phillips. Some actress, a voice, played Michelle Howard on that, on that ship. You need a better agent. <laughs> that should have been you. Because, in fact, it was her. She, she is a representation of how far we have come and how far she has helped bring us. She and so many, so many others helped us to this day. 
some of those that she has listed as role models. Lieutenant Commander Wesley Brown, first African American graduate of Annapolis, and a veteran of both Korea and Vietnam. Lieutenant Ida Pinkins, Ensign Francis Ward, first African American officer, not long after the Golden 13, as he's sworn into the U.S. Navy in 1944. But she is also a great example of how much we as a Navy and a nation need if we put artificial barriers. If we don't judge people based on their ability, based on their capabilities. I hope I have always been passionate about that. But I know the intensity has increased since I'm the father of three daughters. And I refuse to believe that there are any secrets, whether they're glass or otherwise, that they can get to wherever their abilities will take them. And in that, they and countless others in the Navy and out have a wonderful role model in this young power. Now, the other thing, the reason I was told was that about what to talk about, which, which way to go. An analogy on the other side of this story is two years ago at RIMPAC, biggest naval exercise in the world, beginning again uh, right now. We sent 400,000 gallons of biofuel to demonstrate something called the Great Green Thing. And afterwards, when I was talking to the press, I said the big news here is there is no need. This, we put that biofuel in our normal logistics chain, took it out, refueled at sea, refueled in the air, refueled every type of aircraft and every type of first ship that was in that strike group, and the ships and the engines didn't notice the difference. It went exactly as it would have without it. Well, so in that hand, there's no news here now. The Navy picked the best officer to be the VC of A. That's the only thing they have. So those are the two sides. And I think in the end, it's a little bit of both. It's what can be done. It's that there, there should be no barriers, that we are removing the last ones of those. As the CNO said, women in submarines, women on roof of wings. We should not make decisions based on anything but how well you perform in the Navy or anything except your leadership ability and skills, how well you can define that. And I hope and I believe that today is an example of a Navy that now reflects the highest ideal nation that we serve. A nation where success is not born by whiskey and bourbon, but by skill and courage. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the delivery of appointments.
Whose face can a weeping tree show? Is there a whose face in a weeping tree show? When I take this obligation to her. When I take this obligation to her. Without mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Execute the office upon which I am about to enter. Execute the office upon which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Vice Admiral Howard to assume the rank of Admiral. From Chief of Naval Personnel to Admiral Michelle J. Howard, U.S. Senate. Subject, appointment as an Admiral. The President of the United States has appointed you as an Admiral in the United States Navy while serving as Vice Chief of Naval Operations. Signed, D.L. Dylan, Dylan Snyder, Director of Flag Officer Distribution. Secretary Mavis will now present the rank of Admiral and invite her husband to join us on the stage. My distinct pleasure to present you, Admiral Michelle J. Howard, the United States Navy. It is a remarkable sign of leadership to be persistent in your goals and to achieve them. <laughs> Many of you are wondering what my first act will be as Admiral, and I thought long and hard about it. And then I thought, I can call Admiral Greenert by his first name. <laughs> so good morning, CNO. <laughs> I have many of you to thank for this Navy journey. And as I thought about today's ceremony, who was the most important to this event? My list just kept growing and growing and growing. And then prioritizing the list was challenging. And finally, I realized the top of the list was a tie. I must start by thanking Rear Admiral Yoon and Lob Bianchi of the XCOM. If you don't believe today was their first, when I called to order for Star Shirt aboard to the women, they didn't notice. <laughs> a special contract was left 
you folks are seeing the first set in the history of music. Praise God. John, I'm going to let you work that whole quality control thing. <laughs> so thank you, NAVSEP, and, and Next Step. Wayne, Mom, Lisa, David, Sanjay, Jason, Saul, and Lisa. I have friends who are friends. have a Colorado contingent out there, Mark and Deb and Uncle Fred. I also have shipmates from sea and from the Pentagon. And I also have my front office to thank today, Captain Wagner, Meredith, Jake, and Ryan Young. I don't want to mention you all by name, because I would fail. Because every one of you who's in a chair had something to do with me standing up here. I do want to recognize my fellow naval attaches though. This last year, you have helped me succeed. You prepared us for the CNO's travel. You prepared me when I traveled. You've been the wonderful interlocutors with your leaders. And I'm very proud to have served with you in the Beltway, just as when we meet up at sea and I've served with many of the navies of your nations. I'm so very proud to serve with you at sea. So thank you for all of those who represent your countries today. Kirk Jones, it's good to see you. It is fitting on today, having just sworn an oath to the Constitution, and it is July 1st, to talk about the American Revolution. Britain and the colonies had been in a state of war for almost a year when Richard Lee, a delegate from Virginia, in June of 1776, moved that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. He led us to what is a defining American characteristic, decisive words and action. The next thing that happened is also enshrined in our American heritage. We formed a committee. <laughs> but what a committee. John Adams, Roger Sherman, Benjamin Franklin, Robert Livingston, and Thomas Jefferson. The Committee of Five was to draft the reasons for independence and put them on paper. Thomas Jefferson was the chief writer, and his true sacrifice is that he willingly endured the editing of his fellow committee members <laughs> because the final document was cut by 25% from the original. But the words that stayed glorious. And on this day in 1776, on July 1st in 1776, the Second Continental Congress formally adopted these resolutions to declare independence with a unanimous vote. In a letter to his beloved wife, Abigail, John Adams wrote, you will think me transported with enthusiasm. Maybe I'm not. I am well aware of the toil and blood and treasure that it will cost us to maintain this declaration and support and defend these states. Yet through all the gloom, I see the rays of ravishing light and glory. I can see that the end is worth more than the means and that prosperity will triumph in the coming days transaction. In addition to decisive words and action, volunteerism is the core of the United States' personal character and our national identity. The willingness to step up and contribute to a noble cause in your life is a sign of true selflessness. Our sailors and Marines are this legacy. They are volunteers, and with every mission, they demonstrate our core values, values our founders would have understood. Courage, honor, commitment. Around the world, on watch, they embodied decisive words and action. And it has been my privilege to command.
and served with them. And my final thanks today goes to the today's USS, the United States Sailor. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Secretary of Navy, CNO, Admiral Howard and her family, thank you very much for attending today's ceremony and sharing in this special event. This concludes the official ceremony. Please remain in place until the departure of the official party. After their departure, please proceed directly to the reception in the foyer. The official party will arrive to cut the cake in 15 minutes. Admiral Howard will receive you as you depart the memorial. Have a great night.